All right, it's Liam. I want to thank everyone at the Oasis Podcast. As you were. Scotland connections are the way. Like, you know, you're just down the road, you've got King Tut's, right? So, you know, and that was where it all happened. Do you want to tell us about that? I'm sure most of you know the story, like, but uh, to the script, like, pretty much we, we got off with a gig with uh, sharing a, a room with sister lovers. They had a gig up here, so anyway, invited us up for the day. We managed to scrape together just enough to hire the van and all that lot. Um, Lo and behold, we get up here and the bouncers are like that. Ah, you've never heard of you. You're not fucking playing here tonight. Like going, man, we've spent every fucking penny we've had, we've got, just to be here. It was more of an experiment, I'd say, because we were getting no response in Manchester. Um, and I think that was down to the, obviously, the Manchester scene totally burnt itself out. Uh, no one was interested in signing us. And, you know, we used to get fucking stone roses, you know, the little gigs we did do in Manchester. You sound like fucking stone roses, you this, that, the other. Bit of an experiment anyway, we thought we'd, we'd get out of town and see what happens. And lo and behold, it was the, the, the best gig we've, we've ever turned up at. Uh, eventually, sorry, the bouncers let us in. You can pay for 15 minutes, right? But obviously we made a massive impression that night on Alan McGee. And uh, I don't know if he was pissed or whatever, but apparently by the second song, he's like, I'm signing this band. So uh, without McGee, you know, without him, none of us would be here. So that's where I'm looking at. Alan McGee, everybody. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think, like, you said that without Alan McGee, we wouldn't, but do you want to see Dave now? Do you think if McGee hadn't been there that night? Yeah. We had yeah. factory records, we had all sorts of coming down for the rehearsal room to see us. Uh, they just walk away to Manchester. I mean, if you look at Liam, even back then, he, you know, his haircut, everything was Ian Brown, do you know what I mean? Uh, the attitude, the walk, the talk, whatever. But they just didn't recognise it, they couldn't see it. So it took someone like McGee to, uh, to recognise it and obviously know what he's doing. And, uh, he knew he was going to make that band fucking massive, so it was needed. It worked. But he worked. And what about the, the rumour that that's all, it's a lovely story, but it's all bollocks, right? It was all set up, the, the, it would all been arranged for, beforehand, you know, you'd already had management deals, it was all dealings no. in the background, Johnny Marr, it was all sorted, it's all a load of rubbish. Yes. I put it to you. Kate okay, McGee started the ball rolling, so then it was a bit of a fucking panic after right. to, uh, you know, shit, we need management, we, we need this, that and the other. Um, ignition management came on board as a fateful meeting with uh, Noel and Johnny's brother, Ian Ma, met at the Hacienda and uh, started chatting and let him know that uh, you know his Johnny's under ignition management, etc. And that's how the connection was made, and the rest is history. Still there. <laughs> and what about? I mean, that must have been massive to have Johnny. I mean, Johnny's just celebrating his birthday this last uh, couple of days and I mean that to me was like the first you know you talk about the gig but Johnny Marr was there as well you know and then sort of, you know getting old guitars and things I mean as a kid growing up loving the Smith I mean that must have been myself, yeah. massive for you so yeah you know, to we used to pull up at Johnny's fucking double mansion that's all I can call it in hail and I was like I couldn't I was, well most of them looking at the floor you know it's Johnny Marr yeah um, but, you know, he's very helpful, Johnny, in the early days, in many ways, uh, giving Noel a leg up here and there with equipment, so on, advice, yeah. uh, and obviously, well, the best management in the world, and they came on board, yeah. so and so yeah, yeah. And taking it back, I mean, when you were, you started out, I mean, you wrote, your book is fantastic. And who's read Tony's book here? Yeah. <laughs> All lies. <laughs> Tony's book is brilliant, and in this book he talks, you know, uh, wonderfully about growing up in Manchester and what it was like. And uh, you know, do you want to just tell us about growing up in Manchester, what that felt like in the seventies, eighties? Well, I'd say, I mean, I'd, I'd go for all the members of Oasis on this. Like, none of us had money, uh, but we were rich in love and life and you know we had everything we had a fucking dinner we were dressed well every day and even though well me and my brother and the other brother all 
the fucking same. I don't know if that all happened up here, like. But um, yeah, we had nothing, but we had everything. Um, we, I've got to give it to my parents when I was a kid. Uh, I used to follow this the Salvation Army with the drums. I'd, I'd hear them coming for miles. So, um, you know, I'd be right beside them, blah, 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 blah. And they encouraged uh, getting me a drum kit when I was seven or eight years of age, uh, which, you know, was, I think it was 50 quid at the time, late 70s for the first kit. A lot of money. Um, not long after that, I managed to get myself a fucking police curfew. Uh, where my dad being a typical fucking paddy that he is, legged it straight upstairs and put his foot through the base from the fucking place I don't know, blah, blah, blah. But me, naive as I was then, uh, didn't know fucking music shops existed and this, that and the other. Uh, I taped up I taped up the hole both ways and painted it white. We're, we're back in business, so true story. And when you, you started playing drums, you say about the Sally Army and stuff, but, um, and this is a question from the, the, um, from the tribute band guys, but uh, musically, like, what bands were you listening to and who really inspired you as a drummer? Shit. Um, I mean, in our house back then, we had, we had everything from Irish country, American country, traditional, and of course then the Beatles and, you know, my mum and dad didn't quite get into the Stones and all that stuff, but um, th th that was always a constant, the record player, especially on Sunday afternoon, a constant. So it was more, I, I couldn't quite fit a drummer at that point, yeah. Um, but it was more the sound of drums and, and, and you know, my family recognised that come weddings and this, that, and all that, I'd be thrust up behind the kit and I couldn't reach the fucking pedals, my legs were, legs were fucking dangling. But it sort of gave me a taste of, yes, wanting to do, yeah. feeling that I could do that, like, yeah. So, and what records do you listen to? Who's on your wall? Like, what was your music? Like, what was the one that really? Did you have like a moment when it was like, oh, you know, Sid Morrissey or, or punk or what? I was first into the Smiths, but I wouldn't say that was the the drumming end of it. Uh, what really turned me on when uh, with the Stone Roses, uh, Renny, listening to Renny and his fucking brilliant drumming life. Yeah. So that's when uh, you know start to turn more on some music and get a bit deeper into it. Yeah. But George talks about so when the first come out, so you're you're sitting there drumming, a few mates down the pub sort of contact you and say, We're thinking about starting a band. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I was invited down to I mean I think I was the only drummer within a fucking two mile radius. Um, and that was probably the only reason I was asked to do it. Uh, and I had my own kit and all that shit like so um, the original form of uh, line up of the rain was quick spawned. They had Chris Sutton singing, they had a drum machine, the faithful drum machine. So they, yeah, so they needed, they, they needed somebody who could play drums live, so went down to watch him. I can't say I was massively impressed. Yeah. But again, it was like, yeah, it's the next step. I was, was going to be in a band, I've been invited to be in a band. Uh, very impressed by Bonehead at the time. Like, that one could get a fucking tune out of a radiator like he's someone else. So. Bonehead, everybody, come on. And so, like, whose band is it? Like, when you when you look at the rain and when you look at the new early Oasis, whose band was Oasis? Seems like it's Noel Gallagher's now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Yay! Well, that, that, I, I just want to do that. So, so, you know, can we get your thoughts and feelings about Liam Gallagher, please? <laughs> can we get your thoughts and feelings about Paul Gallagher, please? <laughs> Peggy Gallagher. Yeah. Noel Gallagher. Yeah. Bad comment he made, wasn't it, by the way? Yeah. Fuck you, no. Oh, Jesus, alright. So, so, Bonehead and Gleeks and yourself built a sound that was just a wall of noise, right? This, this powerful sound. But when you listen back to those early. Um, so, well, we've never heard anything by the rain, right? So, it's just never got out there. Like, have you got anything? Have you got demo tapes or anything in the rain? I don't know. I don't know. But, but I will say that, 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 you know, that, as you say there, the wall of sound, I was describing that myself a few times, but that carried into Oasis without a doubt. That was a you know, bonehead. Bonehead, his fucking rhythm and turned up to 10. Um, but I found myself sort of competing against that for noise level or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Hence I probably started it in fucking really hard, yeah. 
very simple book, quite hard, straightforward, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah, we did that, we, we, the way I look at it, we've uh, very straightforward music, the original lineup of Oasis, nothing, you know, you know, no grade A fucking musicians in there. But um, it was that simple, there was a bit of space for us all to be heard, if you like. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. So, so you guys have got, so, so Liam comes in with the band. So you've got this situation where you've got this guy Chris, who pretty much was right there from the. Was that difficult in terms of that issue of getting rid of Chris and Liam coming in? I'd say no. I mean, I've got great respect for, for Chris, but we, for many months we recognised, you know, being on stage with him. Good friend, I see him now and again. Um, but he just started, you know, he started doing stuff on stage that we were going, what the fuck's he up to? Like, you know, you get the, the microphone and start. <laughs> All these fucking tricks he's doing, we've got doing a slut drop and all that shit. Fuck's he up to? He shall be well, he can't be an hour man. But anyway, uh, we heard through the grapevine that Liam was uh, mad for joining the band, and uh, so we gently pushed Chris away, like so. And we all knew Liam from early teens, and instant it was like, fucking hell, he'll work, do you know what I mean? He's definitely got the look, the walk, the talk, the girls, everyone's after him. And, uh, all we needed to know could he sing, yeah. but um, you know his voice has massively changed since yeah. I first met him. Uh, he's very high pitched, if you like. He could hit them notes, but Jack Daniels and smoking has fucked him up, <laughs> like the rest of us. No, well that's great. So, so Liam comes into the band now. When when you guys got Liam involved. Did you know that Noel was out there as an inspiral carpet brody yes. and he had songs? Yeah. And was that... I wouldn't say we knew about songs though. You didn't know about the songs? No. But you knew about the connections? Yeah, yeah, we, we knew that for many years from, you know, as I said there before, Oasis was formed within a two mile radius. My mum knew Peggy, uh, a very clicky Irish sort of community. Um, but, we knew years before, again meeting Noel, will say that everyone was envious of Noel being a roadie, if you like. You know, I was he fucking man, is that like, you know. But, um, you know, he was a cool guy, he, he, he slipped in and he, he got a job, told the world and got the, the, I suppose, the experience that was fucking essential for the next step in Oasis when, when, when he was invited in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he comes in and he brings these songs in. So, so I mean, Liam and, and Bonehead have been doing songs as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there was writing of songs and you guys were mainly more what, jamming, putting songs together. Is that how it was pre know how that was working? Yeah, I mean, we only had, what, three or four songs. It's not, they weren't a fucking, you know, a major three albums or whatever. It wasn't there. Um, again, we recognised that that was our weakness. The lineup was good. We needed the songwriters. We needed the songs. So, um, okay, initially, Noel was going to come in as the bass player, yeah, that little secret. Uh, yeah, believe it or not. But that didn't quite happen. He ended up coming down to a Sunday afternoon session that we would be off tour or whatever. Um, but the thing is, them days, everyone was off the tits on a fucking Saturday night, rolling into the, the Sunday when we were at rehearsal, so we're half eat out of our cakes, fucking jamming, but loving it. It was like you'd be on a spaceship. It's fucking madness. <laughs> <laughs> so when Noel comes in with those first few songs, what what was your reaction? <clears throat> then it was like it was. We did. Yeah. How do I put it? They were more very dancey kind of tunes that I. That's like, is that a one for one of a better way of describing it? Like so. But they, they were great jamming songs where we could all join in. Liam just sat back, really. You know. Uh, but like, I better let you know, it's definitely yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 them, them what, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. seeing the sun and all that, but they were more. But again, born out of jams, as every fucking Oasis song generally was, so. Yeah, and then let's say, so you guys have got these early songs coming together, more born out of jams, a bit dancey, a bit more Manchester kind of grooves. But then, really, to bring them together into Definitely Maybe, I think, and I'd like to see what you think about this, it's really about that visit to the real people in Liverpool. Yes, well then, well, to so record them, you mean? So once you had a bit of an Oasis body songs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they, well, again, they instantly recognised there was something going on, but I've got to say, the intention was only him. They were like, he's going to, you know, do it. he's going he's gonna to be the one, he's going to make it and all that. But we used to always say it was, it's not. How was it doing? 
We're all right, we're all right. <laughs> Carry on. That was a good tip. <laughs> um, they were real people. Um, they totally, totally recognised what was going on. Um, and fair play with them, you know, when they'd finished the, the bits of oh, all of us uh, who had jobs at the time, we'd nip over on a Friday night, stay there all night, uh, and they were very accommodating and uh, giving us, you know, advising us the structure of songs. I mean, our jams were like five, six minutes long, and they're going, listen, you can't fucking do that. You've got to trim them up to singles, like, bring them, you know, trim them up, love them, uh, intro, fucking verse chord, whatever, mid late, just bring it down for three minutes. Yeah. Um, they were brilliant like that, but um, they gave us confidence. We all you know there was confidence there already, but they give us that next level. Um, and then where would we be next? And it's the game, wasn't it? Well, then I suppose you're going out and you're playing those songs that the real people help you craft together. And so you've just done a few sort of crappy little gigs around town. Then you get the uh, I think it was right? six gigs. Yeah, six gigs. Six gigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, we were signed by. Yeah. Well, we were that tight yeah. by that point, not we? Um, we did rehearse three times a week, yeah. which is uh, quite knackering, you know, <laughs> doing deep down and all the job and all that lot. So. Yeah. Well, at what point do you stop from the, the, you know, you're giving up your day jobs and you're actually right now we're going to take this seriously? Like, where, where? Because that often when you hear bands interviewed and stuff, it's, it's like they're talking about their influences and all that. But I'm always one of those. Are you still working a day job? Like what? At what point did you, okay, we can, I can quit this now and get on with it? Fuck me, I was working right up to the record deal as far as I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Griggs was, I think, but bottom line is if, you know, if somebody put enough money in our pockets, fuck it, we'll, you know, do whatever you like, so yeah. it was about money, about money, a few quid in your pocket and surviving. Yeah. And truth is, the early doors of Oasis, uh, that's all we generally did was survive. It was, yeah. You know, I think we got 15 quid a day to, to eat and stuff like that. Yeah, so. And so then when, so you've, uh, so you've gone, you've been signed, you sort of, you know, record deal, amazing. Are you suddenly then thinking, right, brilliant, where's all this money? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And where I'm, was it? I'm, yeah, and why are we playing in a, in a club and somebody's going by with a tray of burgers and stuff like that? <laughs> they really, you know, they were really mad little joints we played, but obviously part of the circuit, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we played a gig in Leeds and there was literally fucking two people there. Yeah, and, and that was. Yeah. What was that? The wardrobe? The wardrobe? Dutch is the old. Dutch is the old, I think. Dutch is. Yeah, I think. Dutch is the old. Dutch is the old. Yeah, yeah. I okay, mean, so, so what about the, the um, recording of Definitely Maybe? Let's get on to that. So, so you've gone around, you've played these gigs, you've, you've got that sound. You've helped, the real people have helped you put it together, then you've got to go into the studio and start to put this together. So do you want to tell us about that? Uh, well, every approach was, uh, well our approach was live, the, 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 the drumming, everyone's sort of uh, separated if you like, but it basically it was all live, get through it all pretty quick. Um, so I think we used to about five, five takes and they'd take the best one out of that, uh, and then build on that, that's how they used to work like. So. Owen Morris would instantly, well, uh, Morris would instantly recognise uh, she can do that bit again, or go back and second chorus start, let it stick it all together and make it fucking work, basically. So. Well, I interviewed um, Angela Dunn, who was the recording engineer, um, yeah, and uh, and she was saying that like you guys, so you you worked so hard, you've got to this point, you're ready to record your album. And yet she says you boys were like schoolboys, like running around, as you couldn't get five of you in the room at one time because you were all like running around. Yeah. What were you doing? It was like a holiday to the sort, yeah. <laughs> that, that studio, the sawmills, was like a, it was, it was a fucking summer holiday to us. In the middle of winter. But, yeah. you know, basically, uh, you had to get, a, well, they put us down on purpose because Monmouth was the first, yeah. Morrow Valley was the first take and it, it didn't quite, Dave Batchelor didn't quite get the sound right or recorded us as, you know, the dirty, gritty sound that we have. Um, so he didn't, you know, it's like, shit, we've got to do this again. Um, but they put us in a studio whereby, basically when the tide was up, you could get to it through, you know, go on this little bridge, little lake, and next in the studio's in the corner. But when that, um, that water went out, the estuary or whatever the fuck it was, um, we couldn't go anywhere. So 
it was like you're, you're doing the jobs, you're getting it fucking done, you're not going to the pub, you're not doing anything. So, yeah, we were, we were handcuffed somewhat. Yeah. But I just can't understand it. Like, you guys, why are you there, like, ready to play and, like, so, you know, get it done? But you're all pissing off, like, having a laugh. And she was having to, like, herd cats. There was canoes outside to fuck them out. Fuck no. So you, you get it together. And so when you were first hearing those mixes of Definitely Maybe, what did you think about it? Do, do, do a drip fed to us because you know by that point we'd uh, we were well on the road like so do we kind of when one one was finished it would be sent through uh so we'd be landed on the bus after the gig wherever it might be and you know, we'd all approve if you like so or no yeah well that was it yeah and uh, one thing i wanted to ask you about is the recording of bring it on down okay so if you bring it on down bring it on down everybody yeah! <laughs> so let's, let's talk about that. So, because the story is that you were struggling, you couldn't get it done. They were going to bring in someone else, and then you sit down and boom, you get it first time. Is that true? True. So they brought in a, a session guy. Uh, this was again, I think it was the only trap that we had to get down. The drummer gets blamed for fucking everything, by the way. Only. <laughs> Any drummers out? <laughs> um, yeah, he's right. Um, uh, bring on down, yeah. So bring this guy in. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that particular day, uh, Tony and Chris, the real people, were hanging about in London. So Tony, let's just get in this fucking studio now. And he stood in front of me, the meanest stare, like a fucking. He's simple kind of blah de blah beats, just get you get the fucking muscles going, blah de blah de blah. You're gonna fucking record this. Don't give him your money and all this lot, yeah. So he's already there waiting for his fucking payday, like. And uh, anyway, uh, bang bang brought everybody in uh, except Noel, and I recorded it at the same one. So done and done. Yeah. Well, I mean, something like that, you know, like, you're you're all there to do it, and they're bringing in a session player to do it instead of you. I mean, did you feel at that point, like, hold on a minute, something's up here? So, you, know, you know what, that, that, again, you've got to remember, it was the second time round recording, yeah? I mean, I know a lot of record companies back then used to play games like that. Uh, oh, that ain't good enough, you're going to have to do it again, but you're living in their pockets for fucking, for years, like... So, in that respect, Noel pretty much said, look, I've got to get this done, I've got to get it done. Fair play with him for once, he didn't throw me and say, this is happening. It was fucking more of an order like yeah. So I said, look, whatever, it's got to be done, it's got to be done. So, uh, and then, uh, as a little long build, I got it right. Yeah. But I, I, maybe I was tired, fucking don't know, sometimes it's halfway through, failing a bit, I don't know. And anyway, so let's talk about some of the other tunes on Definitely Maybe. So, like, uh, one of the things that's so special about Definitely Maybe and is so different um, to most other Oasis albums, and if, if you know, if people have criticised your drumming in the past, and yet so many songs that you drum on start with isolated drums, yeah. right? So it can't be that fucking bad if like the whole song is starting with a drum beat. <laughs> so you've got. So we have. So we've got. Live Forever, we've got Cloud Purse, we've got Supersonic, we've got all these songs that start just with your drumming. Yeah. Yeah. What the, I mean, how is that, was, how did that come about? Are you saying, I'll tell you what, Noel, start with eight bars of just me, okay? Where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me. Hey! I don't know what, I go back to... <laughs> we go back to Live Forever, because I remember that used to be kind of a slow acoustic intro. And uh, I, I don't know if it was no, uh, uh, sorry, Owen, 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 yeah, I think it was Owen who said you need to put, do somewhere different there, so just came up with a little Tommy thing, so, but then, you know, that rolled in, uh, bring it on down, and supersonic, like I say, it's all drum beats that are starting, but, um, like simple beats, I've got fucking all my hands up there, like, but, um, very effective for that band, so. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's, and that's why, so many people love definitely maybe so much is that there are is that simplicity, it's that punk edge, that rock edge of that album. That yeah, there's Bennett, there's like Wonderwall has got this like but it's not bring it on down, is it? Come on. No. You need that I think for me, 
the, the Oasis is about that rawness. Uh, yeah. I've said this before, but you know, it, there was a Oasis. There was a dip in the middle with your BA and owls and all that lot, and then towards the end, standing on the shoulders of giants. That no more right saying yeah, yeah. uh, When they start to get back to their old song and uh, sound, uh, meat and potato, if you like, the, the light at Lilas and straightforward tunes. You know what I mean? That's what Noel Gallagher is best at. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want, let's talk about the fact that, um, so you've done Definitely Maybe, and suddenly, like from you guys being just geezers in Manchester, suddenly you're selling millions, like eight million copies. Like, what, I mean, how was it in like Levin's shoe? You were just wandering around being like, I'm now, I was I'm now telling you, are you cock of the law suddenly? I was still myself, you know what I mean? No one was, as Liam said lately, uh, when he went back, he can't, he can't play up in Manchester. You know what I mean? You can't go back to your mates and, at the cock, you'd be fucking told about it quite sharpish. Like, uh, no, I never. I don't think any of us recognised really what was going on behind the scenes. Yeah. So I remember going to say we went. I did an American tour. Come back six weeks later, and you could barely fucking walk into a gig. Like, you know, he's got that. It was that. We got mad, and madder and madder and madder as we were away. Like, so I'm bigger. But I don't remember anyone updating us, by the way, you sold 100,000 this week, or we just got on with the fucking gig and the drinking and the other shit that needed to be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned about America there as well. So when you guys, like, um, you know, one, one of the, the crazy things is that you're absolutely massive in the UK. You're selling out these shows all throughout the UK. Then you go over to America, and it's very different, right? How, that must have been quite... Strange. Well, America, the American tour was after the Japanese tour. Yeah. Yeah, so we landed, you know, Japan. Fucking what a mad, mad, mad place. But uh, the little things that reminded me on this supersonic film, like there was, um, I seen us going by in a pulp mobile. I don't fucking remember any of that. <laughs> uh, but there was oh, literally hundreds of people surrounding us wherever we went. You know, you couldn't you'd barely get into the hotel. You'd walk down the street for some noodles and they'd just pop out the fucking doorways. Uh, big eyes, scri uh, skyscrapers. Uh, they, they were littered about the hotel. Absolute nutty, nutty fans. Very respectful and all that. I've got to give it a. But you, you'd stop off at their own floor and be like 10 screaming girls there going, fuck me. Calls <laughs> up. Um, but so as our, you know, I suppose we got a, a little. Uh, Got our egos brushed a little over there, if you like. Yeah. And then it was a, a case of, right, we've got to fucking conquer America now. But you, you've got to start at the bottom in America. So you can't, there's no, you, you start at the bottom in the, in the, as I said before, in the fucking burger joint, it's all part of the, the, the journey, if you like. Um, but I think there were quite a lot of expats turn out, really. Uh, and I'd, I'd say the actual Americans didn't quite get it till Wonderwall. Well, I mean, I want about them, but uh, that, that was something that broke fucking what's the story and made it sell zillions over there, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you've got to play a game in America. You, you, afterwards, uh, it's all record companies all split up into territories and all that shit. So, after the gig, there's a, a customary meet and greet, and you, you, you could have 30 members of somebody's family, somebody's family to. But when you go off stage, sometimes that's the fucking last thing you want to be doing. Because we didn't play the game, I reckon that was a, a major... It was ignorance, in a way. Yeah. But, you know, we just didn't fucking... It wasn't us. It just yeah. wasn't us. So we're like, fuck that shit, we're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't work, so then, you know, your plug-in next time round might be slight, slightly weaker. Yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. And then what about... So let's, let's move on to... So we're going to go into the Q&A section in a minute. And so what we'll do is we're going to use this mic, and so if you've got a question, kind of gently shuffle over to this side, and we'll go around and pick out individual people to, to do a question to Tony, so it's going to be good. But I was going to say, so, so it sold 8 million copies, you toured the world, you're back over, but the seeds must have been there, like we were saying earlier, that something's not right here. And then having read your book, you get the impression that you would often stand up to Noel, and Noel had sort of treated the band like a dictatorship, and you're one of the people going, hold on a minute, I'm not happy about that. Fuck off. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that sort of, uh, and that might have been your downfall in the group. Yeah, he didn't, he never liked, I mean, Liam was the only one that had ever pretty much given some of his own medicine and then, you know, but if he disrespected me, you know, I'd pretty much give it to him. But before we got signed, uh, that's when it fucking started, you know. 
So there was 800 quid sent up, sorry, a thousand pounds sent up by my gig to do a mini tour. He said, put your whole year back in order. So I'd spent mine, well, I didn't get any of that money somewhat. I, I'd got a 600 pound tax rebate. So I went out, bought a, got a kit of Johnny Roadhouse music. Me, Liam and Noel couldn't afford the taxi then to bring it back to the boardwalk. So we literally, on our shoulders, put a mile and a half walk, uh, got it back there. Um, so I spent my own money, this thousand pound comes in, and Noel's like that on a Tuesday night, what do you like? Uh, just get me skins, I don't need fucking drums. So, right, so it's come Thursday night, and there's a brand spanking 800 pound Les Paul in the corner. I said, where's my fucking drum skins? He said, I've got your fucking gold plate, your drum key, you prick. Whatever he said. <laughs> yeah. So I went away and chewed on that. The next night I phoned him and I fucking gave him the verbal of, oh, I just le leathered him verbally. But apparently he didn't sleep for two days, but it was all fucking building up, his sarcasm and everything. I'm like, going, no, fuck you, you know what I mean? This is our band. Oasis is our band, yeah? Um, basically, I'll give it him uh, verbally. Come Monday, I get a phone call off Liam saying, uh, and he was quite sheepish, uh, me and our kid don't get in the band anymore. I went, for fuck's sake, you know what I mean? I said, okay, that's the case, you hear me out. Everything I'm pointing out to Liam, he said, you're right, you're right, you're right. So, and then the next thing I was reinstated, but I think there was a seed, like you say, a seed sown uh, as a controlling element, if you like, and that went into the record contract, yeah. which I was totally unaware about. And I'd, 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 I'd guess Liam, and, uh, sorry, Bowden and Wiggs, uh, told you didn't understand that. You know what I mean? Well, they were just to sign in and just move on, whereas you yeah, were just we, Yeah, so in his offices, like, you know, went to these big plush offices, we got leathered on the way down, and then you're walking in, and somebody's giving you champagne, and sign that bit of paper there, turn it over on the back, and that was us, and got fucking leathered again. It was just, yeah, a document which is, what, two inches thick A4 paper. But we, I, I, we asked, well, I actually thought Noel was, uh, watching over that, making sure we were all right as a band. Um, but I think it was more uh, putting himself definitely in a position of control. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so let's talk about so you've, uh, what happens next. So Some Might Say is ready to come out as a single. Okay, and you've, at this point, Oasis haven't had a number one. Whatever it made number three in the charts, yeah. I think, December 94. And then you, you go away, you record uh, Some Might Say and the, the piece sides for that. And as far as you're concerned at that point, is this still all, all systems go for the next album? Yeah, all lining up. I, you know, I was given a, I was given an itinerary for the, uh, uh, the recording session, uh, the, the tours we were going to do, Japan, wherever we were going to go. Um, I was given a full fucking diary for the year. Yeah. Um, now I did have a, I call it a faithful fucking argument with Noel in Paris. Uh, at the time I was seeing a girl from America and a uh, drunken argument the night before, but I didn't realise I was next to Noel. So the next day, rather than a quiet word, he's doing his acoustic sound check. Uh, I just finished sound check and he said, next time you fucking keep me awake and I'm fucking sat here, fuck, whatever. I just switched the kiss, get out of the way. Fronted him, full on. I was like, don't ever fucking speak to me like that again. Yeah, and lo and behold, that was probably the last time I was supposed to know going. <laughs> So let's the so so some might say so it's pretty much the last thing you do. So pretty much the last thing you do for Oasis is play some might say that's going to be on top of the pops. Yes, we knew it's going to number one. And you knew it's going to number one. We knew it's going to number one without a doubt. And uh, but yet again, for full effect, I think you know what band goes to number one and then sacks a member. And I don't, I can't think of fucking many like. Right. So but it was a full effect. That, um, media, whatever you like, so, um, Corruption. yes. Corruption. Um, but Noel, Noel was a master at that. He still is the master of the fucking one-liner. You know, in, if you can listen to it, he's quite funny, but tongue-in-cheek most of it, but uh, he knows exactly what he's doing when he's, when he's doing interviews and stuff like that. Absolutely. Right, and let's just pick it up with then, um, what a, a lovely way to end the story, and we will move on to the Q&A, so, Geezer over here, your, your time is ready, okay? So come over this time. Um, <laughs> so, super, you mentioned Supersonic earlier. So in, so in uh, a couple of years ago, Supersonic comes out. 
Okay, so you were involved, you were interviewed for it and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but then you go to the premiere. Yeah. So do you want to tell us about that? Uh, well, we were all, I was told to, uh, I, there was a, everyone was meeting at a particular uh, hotel in town. Um, now I didn't realise that uh, Liam was staying at the hotel and all this stuff. I didn't, uh, I didn't use the production etc. Saying, look, we're making a pre-drink call up. Um, so I went and watched the film, little bits of it, I've got to say I wasn't fucking happy with, of course. Um, but after, you know, a few beers later, I was quite drunk and I thought, Brian Cannon, uh, I'm sure you all know Brian Cannon, but he's like, you're coming back to the hotel, you're going to be fucking partying with us. I was like, going, if any of them says anything, I'm like, I can't fucking handle it, you know what I mean? I won't handle it. So um, anyway, lo and behold, get back to the hotel. Uh, I went, I asked where Liam was, and he out on the balcony. I went straight home to him. Boy, you know what? It's the biggest fucking welcome home. Uh, you know, yes. That's all I want. That's all I want. Uh, I've got to give it Debbie then. Debbie was very accommodating. Took a, Liam demanded a table inside, so uh, Debbie go and get us these these shots, the three part of shots she got. Fuck me, blew me head up. But uh, I sat with Liam for about 20 minutes, but it wasn't about. Oasis or any none of that. How was your mum? How was your dad? How was this? How was that? Uh, at the time, I think he was having a lot of trouble with uh, when he had that king in America and stuff like that. So we were verging on little things like that. But no one, uh, like I say, Debbie, uh, they were all majorly accommodating, and I couldn't have asked for better that night. And considering I'd seen him for fucking hell, 15 years or so, is it six or something like that? 16 years, whatever. Um, I was glad and I was happy that uh, you know, Liam was still there. So. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Alright, so I'm a little bit worried about this. So, so we're going to pass it over to you guys. So come over to this side of the stage if you'd like to ask a question. No, I'm not. What? Well, 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 thank you. Who's up first? Oh, Ian. Cheers. Sorry, what, really happened, what really happened just for the, the night before the whiskey go go? I've got another story, but like, how did that come about? We could get cocaine. <laughs> uh, so we ended up with somebody, I won't be called again, but. Well, yeah, no, just to clarify, this is the Whiskey Go-Go, where you guys all got tips on meth and completely fucked up your big chance in America. Yes? Again. Great. Again. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get cocaine. Yeah. No. No. I saw an interview and Noel was like, we know it's not the end of what really got fucking up. No, no. Apparently we know we're right or anything, they start going over there, but I'm not going to have to show up, so. What? Go on. Hi, Tony, man. My name is John Larsley. Hey, man. Great, man. Listen, I was fucking partying to the ass about the age of 1993, when I died. And see when uh, races came out, it cured me in depression. And see when death and early maybe came out. Cool, uh, that fucking, the drummer. See that fucking album, that cassette. And drumming and fucking beat. Super sorry, rock and roll star, you name it. That's the way it's guys. That's what I'm about. That's what I'm about. I swear to God, my friend, you fucking drag me to hell. Thank you so much. I love you, bro. <laughs> See the next album. The album's going to say that no guy can fight like us, but I don't think fucking you. Fucking you. Tony, you're a legend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, mate. I'd like to ask about Eagles within the band. I'd like to ask about Eagles within the band. Okay. So who has the biggest Eagles? Definitely no. Definitely no. With that, with the success of the band, how do you swear? What do you think is a driving force? Is that a collective? Yeah. Is it nah, well, I'll definitely say that. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he wanted to go. He, you know, he'd learned his craft through the Inspiral Carpets, agents, managers, role managers, blah, blah, blah. He knew exactly what he, he was doing and he knew exactly what he wanted to do and how to do it. So, yeah, uh, he was well seasoned that way, yeah. He knew what he looked to. Cheers, buddy. 
I don't think they did. They tried. They tried. They tried. But as 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 it always goes, like uh, the big man, I'll fucking exhaust the little man as legal things go, if you like. But I mean, the, the, for me, the real people have plenty of fucking legs to stand on. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's three or four teams that are straight to mind um, that they should have been credited. But the uh, well, one that was definitely credited was Tony on the backing vocals. Supersonic. Yeah. I mean, that was just fucking piecemeal, if you like. Yeah. Where's Chris's bit for Columbia? Uh, Don't go away. There's many, so many tunes that he. They had a follow up album, they, they lost their contract to Sony. Uh, I think the Marshmallow Lane never got released. But basically, no fucking ripped that. He just ripped it. One well, last little quick one before I shoot off. Uh, creation are doing a, a, a film now about their style. If you could pick anybody to pick, the other band members to play them. Surely it's got to be Craig Cast for Bonehead. Right. It's got to be anyone. Well, say amen. Who else would play everybody else? We all say that for me. <laughs> Mick Jagger, for me. Can I be Liam? You can, oh, totally. I'll be Liam. All right, brilliant. Totally. Cheers. <laughs> Hi Tony, how are you? Hey, I just wanted to ask, what is your particular highlight of being in Oasis? Sorry. I suppose the uh, highlight is that, well, walking out of Glastonbury uh, to, to an unexpected 30 or 40,000 people out there. I spoke to somebody earlier about this, but um, fuck me, I was, and, and we were getting filmed as well, I didn't know how, but I was holding on to their drumsticks for fucking day alive, believe me. Uh, same as my first, uh, when we were on the word. If you watch that, I've got no fucking neck. I'm that fucking nervous, like, don't drop your drumsticks, like. But, yeah, walking out to 34,000 people and being the legendary gig that it is, you know, brilliant. Yeah, nice one. What's here, Gogo? 1994. Yeah. How is it made for amphetamine? Fucking bang on. I think it was late for about four days, man. Yo. <laughs> oh. Hey Tony, thanks for coming to Glasgow. It's great to see you here as well. Thanks for coming um, Just, I've got two questions. The first question is, um, what is your favourite song to play live that you've played with Oasis? Secondly, which song would you like to have played after you left the band? Right. Good uh, question, everyone. Good question. I, I, well, playing live would be the bring likes to bring it on down and head string cut stuff like that and fucking right in your face songs. Uh, afterwards. Well, I started testing myself afterwards, going, "What? Well, I couldn't fucking drum. What's the story?" So, anyway, what, uh, "Don't Look Back in Anger" was probably the most trickiest in there. But "Don't Look Back in Anger" is I love that tune. I've got to say, what a great song. Well, I was going to say, so anyone else that wants to ask a question, come down this way. We've got a couple more minutes, and then we're going to get on with the music. In the rehearsals of that album, could, had you rehearsed and played some of those other songs? Like Champagne's even over and Hate Now and those other two. This was the thing, like the, um, well, you know, when we were doing sound checks and stuff like that, he'd be slipping in these jams, and it was only years, well, years later, I was like going, I have played that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fucking hell. But again, how it goes in the music industry, I think, if I had any influence on the direction of that song, and I was part of it, 
So uh, Noel wasn't allowed in that place, or anybody. So he was very kept his cards close to his chest till we got to the studio. Uh, and then, you know, when he knew he was recording with off, remember? Go on, then, Obviously, the early days of Oasis were the, the main days, so... Mad you know, the mad crazy gigs you played, where was the best venue you ever played? There's only 12 people there, what are you doing about? Right, like I said before, Scottish and Irish crowds are the fucking best, yeah? Hey! Farrowlands, Farrowlands. Well, you, you don't do it by hours, a lot of, a lot of patties, you don't do it by hours. Man. Hi, Tony. Hey. I've got a real question here, right? Tony, she, Rangers or Celtic? <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, I've got a real... Yeah. Yeah, I've got another question. Uh, do you want to join another band? I wish I could, I wish I was fucking fit enough, but why? Alright, so you spoke about Liam, the young Liam, right? What, what, who was Liam on the scene? Why did you want him in the band? Like, what? When we were growing up, it was a, we used to congregate on a, an outdoor five-a-side pitch with floodlights, which came on till 10 o'clock at night, but um, it's football, basically it was football, and this outdoor pitch, we were going to stay there until 10 o'clock at night, five-a-side pitch, floodlights on, uh, and I remember, it, I, as clear as day, I remember him walking on that, 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 uh, right. yeah, he always had that going on. He, he instantly, something instant about him, and then he opened his mouth and, and you're like, fuck it. Yeah, it's just, you can't ignore him. You can't ignore that for Was he well known? Was he well known, he said? Uh, around the area, uh, yeah, as much as any of us, like, yeah, but not, you know, he all, as growing up, I, you know, spoke to a couple of lads that, did different jobs with him, and one of them was making Holland's pies. I don't know if you to fucking get them up there, like, yeah. But he was making Holland's pies, and he used to be telling about, "I'm going to be famous. I am going to be famous." Uh, I don't think he mentioned being a singer, like, but he, you know, in his head, he, in destination, he, he was going to make it. And there was nothing going to stop him. So I'll ask you later, Rangers. Did you ever do the car washing gig? With, did you ever go off and wash your cars, Man United players' cars, with Liam? Did I work with Liam? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Man and Man City. He washed their cars? He washed their cars, me, Liam and Diggin, if you recognise him. But, um, we, uh, you know, used to be... <laughs> Guys, can we keep it down a bit, please? We're trying to listen to Tony fucking McCarroll here. Yeah. Okay. This geezer with the bleach hands. Very, yeah. very. You should be downstairs eating vegan food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we used to uh, sorry, we used to uh, wash their cars. So the football to pull over in one place, and we'd have to take it literally 300 yards. But I'll, I'll never forget Peter Schmeichel's big fucking long murk and his legs obviously much longer than mine. But uh, I didn't realise the electric seats and all that. But so literally, I was on tiptoes try to get this fucking 100 grand merc from one place to the other and not kill the fans that have turned up for signs, the <laughs> signings and stuff like that, signatures. But a uh, few times we went to live, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Uh, on balloting and when we got a... Uh, well, it was actually fucking useless, to be honest, but uh, plastering, we went out plastering a bonnet a couple of times, but Liam was pretty much made a fucking tea and that was it. Yeah, <laughs> sit down, skin up, that's it. Yes. Uh, how you doing, Tony? Um, oh, yeah. Two questions. Are you ready for a pint? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, and, uh, what was your favourite uh, support band? Was it, what's your favourite support band of Oasis that you can do? Looking back, right, there was, there were so many bands that were on board with us, uh, or supporting, or, you know, I've got to go the Verve. The Verve. Yeah. They were very, very similar lads to us, you know, North West, whatever. Uh, pretty cool fellas, so... That's not bad, not bad. Well, you guys supported the verb, right? That's how it started out. Yes, and I think it soon switched round. <laughs> well, hi, Mr. McDonald, just a quick question now, with the races to some degree. Um, the band's not playing anymore, as all the guys know. Uh, what do you think about the plethora of bands coming up, the tribute bands, and have you seen any? Yes, I've seen a few and I've been majorly impressed. I've got, I've got to say that a few of them closed my eyes 
close my eyes and I'm fucking back to 1994. Like, so, so that's a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what? What a brilliant tribute to the band. Do you know what I mean? That like, people are out there doing it. It's uh, it's an honour. Yeah. Uh, Have you heard of these guys, Columbia, yet? Definitely. All right, okay. Yeah. I'll just leave it there then. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's one thing I, one thing I was going to say. Anyone else? Last question, okay? One thing I was going to say is that that is crazy that Oasis tribute bands sell out like 500,000 venues. It's cr it's unbelievable. But but th there's this passion for Oasis. Like, there isn't. Why has there not been another band that's done it since Oasis? Uh, you know, do, would you agree that there's a lot more to Oasis than just the music? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm talking like the, well, the sun got behind it, the, the design and page and all that, but there's always an antics fucking going on at Oasis gigs, whatever it is, always madness, so. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony, 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 do you listen to it or do you go fuck the infant and turn it over? No, no, no. Do you actually... Yeah, I'll, I'll tune in. One big mistake I've made over the years, when I, I don't know what you all thought, when you first heard What's the Story, what was your impression like? Amazing. Hey. Right. <laughs> one thing I've learned, <laughs> one thing I've learned is not to... When I first heard What's the Story, when they fucked it, they fucked it, you know what I mean? They fucked it, fucked it. But, uh, Oasis, then you listen to it again, you learn something else and go, oh, that was a good line, or that was a good drum beat, or... So, for me, Oasis songs are growers, and I'll, I'll never judge it too fast, like, but generally they're brilliant. Yeah. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, give it up, please. Hey,